know, Chase gave a little brief uh, introduction of who I am, but uh, I've been up in Alaska a long time, and I spent a lot of time with the Koyakon and the Gwich'in people. And in their traditional way, when you introduce yourself to an audience, you pay homage to all lines of your family. So in that, I guess, I, I just wanted to share my lineage, and I think it'll play into uh, where I'm going with my stories. So uh, I was born in Chihuahua. I grew up in Cheney. My parents were teachers. My mother grew up on a cattle ranch in Okanagan County, where, uh, near where her father's family had homestead in the 1800s. Uh, Conconelli is our family graveyard overlooking the lake. Um, and so her mother was a school teacher at Happy Hill, a nearby one-room school. It's actually a two-room schoolhouse because all the bachelors built the school. The downstairs was a school, but the upstairs was a dance hall. And uh, so every new teacher was basically the fodder for all the, the bachelors. And that one year, my grandfather was lucky enough to, <laughs> to score. So, uh, and then on my father's side, uh, they were last, uh, his father uh, joined the Navy in World War I, lied about his age. Uh, he was from Omaha, Nebraska, came out on the battleship Omaha and uh, met my grandmother who was born in Rock Springs, Wyoming in 1895 and they were Finnish coal miners that came to uh, Wyoming in 1892. And ultimately over here at Carbonado, my great grandfather resides. Uh, he was killed in a blast in 1899 with 32 men. And my 15, uh, his 15 year old son, my great uncle who lived to 102, and I had a lot of chances to ride the country and listen to his stories. Um, he became the breadwinner and his mother was not cast out on the street because they lived in mine housing in Carbonado. So he became the breadwinner for his family. So that's my lineage, and, um, and then my parents met at uh, Eastern Washington University. Ultimately, my dad was a professor there, um, got paid to play. He taught fly fishing, racquetball, those kind of things. And, uh, and he was a passionate fly fisherman. So at an early age, I started boating rivers, the Klickitat, the Ho, the Queets, the Grand Ron. And my job at his 11 or 12 year old was to hold him in a hole behind a rock so he could fish the river. And uh, he burned me out probably by age three, so I can't even tie a hook on a line. But um, from that, I became a boater. And, uh, and from an early age, probably I'd say in my teens, I had this premonition that I was gonna die in Alaska. So, the premonition is never said whether I'm going to die young or old. I might live to 102 like Uncle Bill. So I always knew I was going there. And I married a biologist that worked for Fish and Wildlife as well. I was Fish and Wildlife. I started in 1974. And one day we were in northern Nevada and she came home and said, I'm tired of the brown. I'm going north. I have just applied for a job in Alaska. So I applied, got a job. and. Uh, if anybody has ever been those, to those larger national wildlife refuges, there's no way to get around except for the rivers. And uh, with my background running rivers, it was, it was just a match in heaven. So uh, that's where I've resided since 1992. And I would be remiss with not, not sharing a bear story. So I think I'll start with that. So um, every summer, the biological staff and myself would plan these river trips. Well, we were going off the Dalton Highway on the Canudi National Wildlife Refuge, one of the rivers up there. And so we try to leave out of Fairbanks so you can get to the Hotspot Cafe, Teresa's great burger joint. It's five miles north of uh, the Yukon River. And so sure enough, we hit it at noon exactly, we go pulling into the hot spot, and here is Teresa and her worker out in the middle of the parking lot, all distressed, because the bear had just eaten their pig. And so we pull in, and she's in tears, and 
So Tim, one of the biologists, goes over to the outhouse. The rest of us follow Therese up to the, the pig pen, and sure enough, it's all smashed down, big black bear prints. So bad, so sad, no pig. So we go back, order, in the meantime, Tim, Tim on his own goes wandering up to the pig pen. And uh, after a while, he comes back down, Teresa's cooking the burgers, and, and Tim doesn't say anything until Teresa comes out to get his order. And, she, and Tim goes, well, what are you gonna do with that other pig? And she was like, what other pig? The, the bear ate it. And he goes, no, the one in the bottom of the pickle bucket. Up there was one of those five gallon pickle buckets and we go up there, and I'm thinking a pig, this is a little wiener, and he is glued in the bottom of that square pickle bucket, not coming out for anybody. <laughs> so the bear did not eat the pig. <laughs> um, and with my background with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, I wore many hats. I spent a lot of time in the ro remote communities, being a teacher, being a biologist, it was a perfect world. You, you know, if anybody is thinking of a career, I'd gladly talk to you about that. Um, but one of the other jobs I had was law enforcement. And indeed, U.S. Fish and Wildlife sent me not once, but twice to Vieques, Puerto Rico, no hablo espanol. And uh, I, it was great because the Puerto Rican people on these islands are just like working with the village people. Everybody's related to everybody else. And so it felt like home. Well. We got a call one September, ICE, Customs, everybody, they're doing a reverse on the, Dalton High, uh, on the Alcan Highway, and they're stopping all the vehicles leaving Alaska. And uh, what they're keying on are commercial fishermen. If there's commercial fishermen here, I apologize, but uh, they were thinking that they're running large amounts of cash, maybe drugs, and so they were doing this sting, stopping every vehicle leaving Alaska. Uh, and I could write a book off the stories, but uh, I thought I'd share a couple of those stories with you. And they, had, they told me uh, when I showed up, they got a hold of me because it's September and they knew there would be game violations and virtually every vehicle leaving Alaska, they all have eagle feathers so bad, I gotta take your eagle feathers, didn't write them tickets, but I had a pile of eagle feathers about two feet high. <clears throat> well, in the course of that one evening, and they told me they were trying to stop all these big Electras and Cadillacs because these big cars can carry a lot of stuff that they were keying in on. And so in the course of that, here came one of those vehicles. And it was at night, they had the spotlights on it. And, uh, and I looked, through, I mean, you could see these guys quiver, these agents. They had the drug dogs, everything. And one of those cars show up, oh, they're excited. They know it's gonna be a hit. And I look through the crowd of agents that are swarming on this car. It's Doug Green, the guy I bought my house from. He's a gold miner out of, uh, out of uh, oh, Caltag, or no, Ruby. That's where he's a gold miner at. And I, I just happened to be standing with the head DEA guy, and I go, that's the guy I bought the house from. And he looked at me, and he was dead serious. He goes, did he screw you in the deal? <laughs> I go, no, no, he's a great guy. So he wades in there with all these agents who were just swarming the car, cut them loose, and in the spotlight, I go, hey, Doug. And he's like, Barry? And, <laughs> and they cut him loose. Well, a year later, Doug shows up at my house that he built with his wife and his daughter. And he goes, oh, my God. He goes, I saw you. I panicked because I had the trunk full of moose meat with the, my brother shot, and there's no tag on it, no transfer. <laughs> I go, oh, Doug, that was the least of your worries. <laughs> if you had screwed me on the house deal, you would have been in the back room strip. <laughs> and it was amazing at the customs house. How many of you have driven the Alcan and been through the customs house? Well, and haven't you? You were born in Fairbanks. You guys are from Healy, for God's sakes. Anyway, um, there was even a wildlife moment. I thought I'd share that one, too. So the customs agents had been feeding this little cross fox. And you're kind of, here I am fishing wildlife, and it's like, oh, come on, guys, you know. But this little cross fox, they've been doing it a while, so he's habituated. And he curls up on the cut bank right by the customs house, and you see his little green eyes right there in the, the light. 
And I just happened to be standing on the center line, not much activity going on. I think there was four of us standing there. And then all of a sudden, just seeing the edge of the light, over the cut bank, headed for the fox, was a snowshoe hare. And on the tail of that snowshoe hare was a wolf. And the snowshoe hare is zigging and zagging for his life, and he literally ran into the fox. The fox jumps up, and you see this wolf go, hare, fox, hare, bigger, <laughs> boom. Well, where's the fox? We've been feeding him. So he beelines for us, and I kid you not, they hit the, the pavement right beside us, and we're on the center line, and off to Canada goes this fox with a wolf in its tail. And it was like, holy crap, you know, you can't make this up. And about 20 minutes later, here came the little fox, curled back up on the cut bank, and then all night long, in the light, you see this wolf hovering in the background, so the fox made it as well. Um, I'm thinking I could probably end with a bear story too. Uh, I have a young son in Missoula who's a life member of BHA as well, and, uh, uh, and he's been my world traveler. He went to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, but he learned by his sophomore year he didn't have to stay in Alaska, and he went to Europe, and he could take his classes online, and that was his sophomore year, and I go, well, why don't you do a formal thing? So. He actually went to university, Stockholm University and uh, studied there. Well, he's with the international students. So this whole plethora of kids from all over the world, world from this Kazakhstan to India to Austria. Anyway, we've had a, a bunch of them come up to float rivers. And uh, so one summer we had these two young, beautiful Austrian girls that came. They were friends that lived on the floor next to him. And of course, right away, the father's like, what is my daughter getting into going to Alaska? And we're going to do a river trip. And I don't know if any of you have been up the Dalton Highway, but there was a river up there. It's called the Atahoon, uh, the place we go down, or people call it the Attigan. And uh, it's where a lot of bow hunters hunt from out of state. Um, but there is a gorge. And when I first heard about that gorge, I was told it was unrunnable. So, whoop. After doing a few Grand Canyon trips, that was a river for me. And so uh, that's where we went. And I've been doing it a few years. Um, so, of course, the girls coming from Europe are all worried about bears. And, of course, you're assuring them, you know, there, there won't be a bear. It won't be a problem. You'll see them at a distance, and that's it. So we make it through this Class 4 whitewater. We get down on the easy stuff. And it's a kind of a braid, gentle water. and uh, I had one of the Austrian girls, my son had the, another Austrian girl, and my other son was in a kayak. And Kai, my son in Missoula, goes, Dad, there's a wolf on the gravel bar up ahead. And just then, I could just see the tail end of an animal going into the willows. And as we got closer, that wolf stood on its hind legs. <laughs> and it was like, it was a grizzly. But I could see it was a young grizzly bear, and this is July. And all of a sudden, that grizzly jumps down and charges into the river. And I actually got a picture. As Kai, my son, said, you know, it's only my family. Instead of getting a gun, they get the camera out. And, <laughs> and so I got a great picture of this bear hitting the river coming. And I, but he's coming at me, and I'm thinking, geez, I'm just going to hit him across the face with the oar. And right at that minute, my raft grounds out. I got the poor Austrian girl, and I'm stuck. Here comes the bear. So I stand up, and all of a sudden the bear realizes I'm not something small, I'm tall. And it immediately turned tail in the river, starts bawling like a baby, and ran away. Well, and I wish, the, the, it was a shot, one of those shots that you always hate. It's a, in, blazoned in your mind. But my son with the kayak, Cal, who's a, a real deal predator, paddled the kayak to the shore, and it turns out there were siblings. So these two young grizzlies, two-year-olds, have been kicked out by their mom, and they are both got their heads sticking out. Cal's got his camera up, and, uh, and then they started trailing us down the river. So we're yanking on the oars and trying to put some distance on them. And uh, 
we finally scrubbed them off because the river kind of turns into a, a, a main channel again. And we went down about three miles. Well, surely that's far enough to leave these bears behind. So we we're making camp. We just landed, just pulling stuff off. And Cal, my older son, goes, Dad, there's a bear in camp. And well, immediately I thought, these are the, the young bears. And I look up, no, it's a big bear. And he sees me, we lock eyes, and he goes, holy shit. Because he thought, he could see us, and I'm sure he thought we were caribou, that he was going to waylay, but then he realized we're people. And as far as you could see over the tundra, I took pictures of him. He didn't stop running until he was miles away. And that is the difference up where we are in Alaska because bears and people are part of the food chain and you respect each other. So I have a truce with them, they have a truce with me. So, thanks. Thank you, Barry.